Uh, good night, everyone. Um, yes, I'm a geologist at the, with the National Oil Company of um, Trinidad and Tobago. We call Petrotrin. And I'm based here in Houston working on a project with um, Steve Getz, George Klein, and Bob Weiner, and my co worker, Dion Joseph. So um, we're doing some interpretation on the uh, onshore um, treaty seismic that was recently shot in Trinidad. Um, so, yes, uh, Dr. Klein, um, on reading up on Trinidad, um, saw some of my work and he asked me if I would um, be willing to present. So, here I am. So, the title of my talk is The 4D Understanding of the Evolution of the Penal Barapo and Decline in the Southern Sub Basin Trinidad. And that's all well and good if you know anything about Trinidad. Um, so, I'll begin by introducing you to the Caribbean Plate, Eastern Venezuela Basin, and then I'll talk a bit about um, the regional setting, Trinidad. We have an onshore bit round that's adjacent to my study area, right? Um, the, and then I'll start going through my interpretation in a small part of the penal Barapo anticline. But it's such a complex area that um, I really need to ease you all into this, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, to get your bearings, uh, we're here in Houston, right? Um, this is the Gulf of Mexico, Yucatan Basin. Uh, and then we step over, came and trough into the Caribbean Plate. <clears throat> the, so, the, so, Jamaica is the um, highest point of the Nicaraguan rise. That's where I did my undergrad. Um, they have a geology um, degree, undergrad degree over here. Um, it's also where um, Dr. Krishna Prasad, he was the first um, Trinidadian geologist who got his PhD, he went to school here. Uh, so then we step across from the Nicaraguan rise, across the Beata Ridge, which stems from, the, from Hispaniola, into the Venezuelan basin. And this is the Caribbean plate. We have the Caribbean plate is moving at approximately 20 millimeters per year, according to um, Weber. And uh, then we have the Aves Ridge, which is a Paleocene uh, uh, island arc that, um, that basically was abandoned. You have the Grenada Basin, a back arc basin. Then the active island arc, made up of all these bunch of islands, Antigua, Montserrat, which is always active, Dominica, the most active of all. Right? And then we have the Tobago Trough and Barbados, which sits on the accretionary prism. And Barbados has a, a small oil field, the Woodburn oil field. Um, they produce just, a, just about a thousand barrels a day. But um, their, their government is promoting a lot of blocks offshore. They've shot a lot of 2D lines. Um, Conoco did a lot of work over there. They drilled a well, but it was dry. But there's a lot more work going on in that area. Very complex as well, just as Trinidad. And Trinidad sits in the southeastern corner here, just at the boundary of the South American plate and the Caribbean plate. So you can imagine it's a complete mess. <laughs> so zooming in on Trinidad. All right, here's, this is Trinidad, <coughs> Tobago. This is Caracas back in Venezuela, Georgetown and Guyana. What you're looking at here is one of the most prolific oil hydrocarbon basins in the world, the Eastern Venezuela Basin. Mm -hmm. And traversing from the southwest to the northeast, we have the Orinoco River, which um, I've been told is about 2,200 kilometers in length and um, drains an area of about 950,000 square kilometers from the Andes in the north and the west, the Amazon in the south, and the Guyana Shield in the east. <clears throat> so, um, the Geological Society of Trinidad and Tobago, we ran a, a trip actually from Trinidad through the, the Delta to Tucupita, then to Cedar Bolivar, and flew to the Canaima National Park. And here sits Angel Falls, the tallest waterfall in the world, a very majestic site. So I'll give you all a little sneak peek of that. This is Angel Falls. <coughs> These rocks here are the Roraima group, here early to mid-Proterozoic, close to two billion years old. Um, 
And uh, we ran this trip in um, 2012, July. We're gonna run a next one in, um, sorry, June. Uh, yeah, we're gonna run a next one in July um, this year. So you're all welcome to join us on that. We leave from Trinidad, of course, right? <laughs> um, so this is the world for us about, um, about a, a kilometer high. And um, these, this is all made up of sandstones and conglomerates that were deposited in ancient um, lakes uh, during the Proterozoic. So this and other areas basically source the, the Orinoco River, which eventually feeds, feeds all this way down to the Trinidad area. So, uh, again, Trinidad and Tobago. Now let's talk a little bit about Tobago. So Tobago is made up of mainly um, Cretaceous, uh, volcanic, uh, igneous, and metamorphic rocks, and a Pleistocene um, coral cap to the, to the southwest here. So, that's interesting because the most of the islands in the Caribbean, the island, present-day island, arc system, is actually Miocene and younger in age. This is a much older island arc. It would belong to a much older island arc, right? And um, a few interesting things about Tobago, offshore the west coast of Tobago, you have companies such as um, British Gas, uh, Centrica, and Nico Resources, who've um, established some very um, sizable um, biogenic gas fields. There's also a hint that there may be a thermogenic um, source in this area, so they're doing a lot more exploration. 3D seismic has been shot over this entire area. The area is called the North Coast Marine Area. And um, towards the east here, BPTT has taken some deep water blocks and they'll be exploring um, yeah, on the, in that area there. Um, but what most people know about Tobago is that it's sun, sea, and sand, pretty beaches, nice blue waters. Um, so this is an area on the, in space site. It's very good for scuba diving, right? Um, uh, it's low Cretaceous, North Coast, schist, very complex area again. Um, uh, here's what I propose to my fiance, just by the way, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, um, so what people say about Trinidad, and as I spoke to some of you all before, it's, um, it's known as a graveyard for geologists. It's, it's synonymous with complexity, and <laughs> yes, and as Ms. Johnson told me, if you can map here, you can map any basin anywhere in the world. All right, it's got everything you can think about, right? Um, but. Though daunting all of these factors, um, I guess I'm not old enough or deeply buried to have optimism completely fractionated out of me, right? As yet, right? So on a more positive note, Trinidad was the birthplace of many things, including me, right? So it was the birthplace of micropaleontology, some pioneering oil exploration, apparently the first fishing job was done in Trinidad on the first well that was ever drilled in Trinidad, right? So that's how bad it gets, right? Um, it, we got the we got uh, the largest natural asphalt lake. This this is the Pitch Lake, right? Um, in the world, and the oil industry sprung the steel pan, which was you know the last musical instrument that was made in the 21st century. Um, of importance, in 2009, Trinidad supplied 75% um, of the U.S. Um, LNG imports. That's dropped now, but um, yeah, it's quite significant. This area, though, is important. I'll show you all this area a bit later. It's right here, and it's located right at the junction of one of our major faults. So clearly not much planning went into that. All right. So, <laughs> on to the geological setting. All right. So Trinidad, again, is located at the southeast corner of the Caribbean plate and in other margin of the South American plate. <clears throat> and basically what we have going on here is that uh, the Caribbean plate is overriding what we call the Proto-Caribbean plate, which was formed when North America and South America spread apart from each other. 
and South America is subducting below the Caribbean plate. So basically, we're sitting on two or three plates, right? This small little island is sitting on two or three plates. And um, again, this is the North Coast area here with those biogenic gas fields. We have thermogenic and biogenic gas fields here with condensates and oil. This is the East Coast area, popular area, um, operated by BP, Repsol, you name it, they're all out there. Um, this, is a, this is the Los Bajos Fault, right, crossing the island here. Again, a whole bunch of oil fields around here. And this is the Soldado Field, more oil fields. <coughs> So looking at Trinidad topographically, we simplify things, thank God. We have the Northern Range, Central Range, Southern Range, three mountain ranges, right? And in between these, we have two, broadly speaking, piggyback basins, the Kearney Basin and the Southern Basin. And you can make out that there are some linear features in here which turn out to be very major faults. This is the Los Bajos Fault, and this is the Central Range Fault. So looking at surface geology now, the <coughs> northern range is actually completely different from all of this stuff down here. Northern range is made up of Cretaceous and Jurassic metamorphics, and it's actually a north verging anticlinorium, whereas everything else down here is more or less southeast verging, right? <coughs> <coughs> right, so this is the southern basin, right? So this is the area that I'm going to be talking about a lot more. So if we were to look at a cross section across the entire country, more or less, from the Kearney Basin, this is the Kearney Basin Central Range, what we basically have is Pleistocene to Paleocene rocks that sit on Lower Cretaceous. The Upper Cretaceous source rock inside here is absent. And that's something to unravel. Right. The Central Range Fault basically controls this piggyback basin. It's a, a lot of extension inside here. And the Central Range basically is an area where the Cretaceous rocks are duplexing and causing bidivergent bi um, trusting in the middle Miocene rocks. So if we move towards the south from here, this way, what we're going to see is all of these, this middle Miocene being imbricated on Cretaceous rocks. And the Cretaceous only ramps up again near the south coast, right? So the area I'm gonna be looking at is inside this mess. <laughs> nice. <laughs> right, so just, just to um, emphasize again, this is the Los Bajos Fault, <laughs> the Central Range Fault, right? And the Pinal Barapo and Decline is an anticline that's actually sitting below the syn below the syncline and runs all the way out to the east coast. Right? And there are other anticlines that can be traced almost all the way to the east coast as well, which has implications for exploration of the east coast for the, the eastern extent of these anticlines. Um, Petrotrin, however, operates this area and so we're, we, I'm trying to explore this area f to, to find the, the southwesterly plunging nose of this anticline and to test um, uh, the middle Miocene rocks as we go towards the southwest where, they know, where the anticline is plunging out. So this is interesting because Petrin and the Ministry of Energy have an ongoing bid round. And this is the Penal Barapo field. I'll be looking at this area here. And these are three blocks that they've put out for bid. This first, this first block, the Rio Clara block, the gray areas are all 3D seismic that Talisman shot back in 2005. Um, and they drilled um, four exploration wells inside here to test the Cretaceous. Um, other areas, this is the Ottawa block. It's got um, 2D seismic lines that were shot by Exxon and Petrotrin back in the 1990s. It's got a bit of 3D as well, too. Um, this area, the St. Mary's block, has got um, 3D data from 
and British Gas and Petrochrin, and uh, all these white areas in between are actually producing fields that have been excluded. So they're asking you to basically bid for blocks that surround producing fields, right? Um, the, the work that I'm doing with Steve and George and Bob and uh, my coworker Dion right now is in this area here, not Northwestern 3D seismic, this gray area here. So this is a 250 million barrel field and it's sitting next to these three blocks. So get bidding, right? <laughs> okay, so um, <clears throat> this is a cross section from um, the southern town, San Fernando, down to the south coast of Trinidad. And basically what you see, you see a series of the, all these folded and declines being trusted over, right? This is the Pliocene, Middle Miocene, Top Cretaceous. So what Trinidad is made up of in this area here is basin floor fans and deep, deep water um, shales that make up the Naprima Hill, argillites, um, that's a source rock. We got middle Miocene turbidites, and then this was then capped by a uh, passive 40 infill of the forest formation, for example, and all of these are the deltaics that, that the Orinoco, um, as the Orinoco, prograded across Trinidad. That's the basic setting, so you can see that most, most of this folding would have happened before a lot of this came, right? Um, for example, um, in the Barak Bore field, because things have been folded over that much, you can actually penetrate one formation three times, sometimes more. All right. So for instance, in the Pinal 202 well, you find the overtrust sands here. This is the middle Miocene. Intermediate, again middle Miocene, and then subtrust middle Miocene. This well made um, 1.5 million barrels of oil. So to understand this tiny complex area, we have to go all the way back to the late Permian because Trinidad was well, more or less the center of the world, right? <laughs> right. And uh, at, this, um, <laughs> at this juncture, that's where um, uh, North American plate and South American plate started spreading apart. And when that happened, we set up a rift setting. So this rift setting, we basically uh, have most of the blocks are down to down to the north, right? And we start infilling this with um, passive margin deposits of the Naprima Hill source rock, with you know turbidites here and there in it. Um, so as so this setting basically continued. Oh, sorry, one more. Oh, this uh, this is the source rock extent. It's shown that um, it extends all the way around South America, it's proven in West Africa, the same source rock, more or less, right? Um, this is Zaida's field um, in French Guiana. <coughs> this is CGX. They're a company that they're exploring um, basically the Guyana area. They're doing a lot of work in, inside there. They have some blocks and they drilled a couple wells there. Um, we're good shows, but um, they had problems getting down to the target. Yeah, so this, this setting basically continued into the late Eocene, the same passive setting with um, turbidites being deposited amongst these miles. And then things started to change by the late Oligocene. And that's because the Caribbean plate has now started to have an effect on the Trinidad area. So it started to invert all of these rift blocks, right? Um, this area here, this is the main um, depot center of the, what we call the, the late Oligocene Nariva formation. And these sands are not really found in, in the areas further to the south. So by early to middle Miocene, when things get even more interesting, we invert most of these structures and we shift the depot center from a uh, northeasterly trend to a more east northeasterly trend as the Caribbean plate is basically smashing into South America. Right? 
So at this time, we have been depositing the retrench, the Herrera that I will talk about more about, the Karamat turbidites into this, these upper centers. And to wrap that up, by late Miocene, a lot more folding occurred within the southern basin. And um, the depot center again shifted further to the south. So that's my introduction to Trinidad for you all who didn't really know anything about Trinidad. And so now I'll start talking about my uh, project that I did at the University of Leeds. <coughs> So the aim of this project was basically to create a 3D static model of the penal barapo and decline as best as possible, and to try to uh, restore this and decline to different times to come up with, it, with, with this evolution and, and possibly to understand the depositional pattern of these deep water turbidites onto such um, topographies. So again, the study area is, is outlined here in yellow, right? Uh, these, these are two, it comprises of um, 11 2D lines and um, two strike-oriented strike, um, lines. It's not much data. You have 115 Herrera penetrations within this area, but they're all mainly clustered on the eastern part of the study area because the entire Barapo field basically turns all the way this way. Um, so I'm basically trying to, to explore down the, the, the west southwesterly plunging nose of this anticline as it plunges into the Los Bajos Fault. <clears throat> so the, it's bounded to the north by the Debe Wellington anticline and to the south by the Rock Dome anticline. And these anticlines are actually out of sequence, which makes things even more interesting because uh, they have the rock dome and decline, for instance, is actually Pliocene in age, whereas Parapo is understood to be, you know, middle, middle Miocene in age. So, <clears throat> so let's let's dive into this area, right? So this is a 2D seismic line across the eastern part of the study area. Um, we got pretty good well control in this area, um, a deep test Rocky Palace well, which was drilled by Petron and Exxon back in 1996. <coughs> and this well went down to the middle Miocene here on the Solomon Anticline, and then down into the Cretaceous. This is a Barapo Anticline though. It's real smushed up. It's got a back, a back truss. Uh, it's made up of um, the over truss, the intermediate and the sub truss. Um, these wells, for instance, all made uh, a, a million barrels of oil each. These wells inside here. So to the north, we have the Debe Wellington anticline, and then the Barapo anticline and Rock Dome anticline to the south. We have what is believed to be two detachment surfaces, two main detachment surfaces. One uh, Oligocene age detachment, which sits just above the the the, um, the Eocene Navet formation. And then we have this uh, Jurassic or Cretaceous detachment, which is possibly due to evaporites uh, during the spreading center of the area. So if we move along towards the western part of the study area, Again, we have an another um, deep well, the Kura 188 well, came down here, found Middle Miocene, and then the Cretaceous. <clears throat> the Barapo and Decline is much more subtle here, very low relief. However, ACO1 found the Middle Miocene here, and then repeated down here. This and Decline has got a lot, of, a lot, lot more pr um, uh, folding in this area here. All right, it's pr Pro prograding towards the south, right? <coughs> and uh, this well, the Pfizer 1015 well, is the only well in this area that actually found oil at the middle Miocene level. Everything else was wet. And it's actually down dip of this. But again, the, we have the, the Oligocene detachment and a possible Cretaceous detachment. 
In this area too, we have a lot more back trusting associated with the Los Bajos Fault. <coughs> so if we look at a line that's running from southwest to northeast now, across the study area, in the eastern part, we have the developed field for the where, where we have the overtrust, the intermediate, and the subtrust. But as the line moves towards the southwest, unfortunately, we only image the subtrust. But what's interesting is that we have two main faults running, cutting across this structure. This one, I call it main extensional <coughs> one, but it's not necessarily extensional, right? It shows growth stratigraphy at the Pliocene level. And what does this mean? This means that, well, this fault could have, um, could have existed before and was then reactivated <coughs> during the Pliocene as the, delta, as the Orinoco Delta prograded across Trinidad. So the east-facing faults seem to have growth stratigraphy. This west-facing fault, though, doesn't have any growth stratigraphy up here. So is this, a f is this fault a uh, preserved structure that, that, that <coughs> exists down there? And maybe we can test around this structure. What's good too is that it's away from the main field. It's actually way, way down to the southwest. And ve very, um, very little wells have drilled around this structure at all. The Los Bajos fault at surface is shown as a back truss, and a depth is shown as a northeasterly facing um, deep fall that goes down to possibly the, um, the, the basement level. So using, um, using Petrel, I was able to um, map these separate um, horizons within these separate truss slices and create a sort of um, uh, a sort of static model for the Barapo anticline. So this is the Barapo anticline. This is the Solomon anticline to the south that the Rocky Palace well tested. And this is that main fall that's dropping down everything towards the southwest, right? This area inside here, inside here, are zones where the sands are absent. And that's interesting, and they, they, they seem to always map out as elongated elliptical structures. <coughs> and um, it, 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 it hints that possibly the signs are synkinematic, and so while the position was occurring, you had these subtle um, highs, and the signs were um, being deposited around these highs and, ab and, uh, and so absent in these areas. Um, so I infilled my, my interpretation with the well data that I had in between, came up with this model, and then took this into Midland Valley Move. Midland Valley Move is a restoration software. In this case, I, I had 2D lines, so I, I used 2D Move to start with. Um, but then the challenge to restore this is that you need to know what happened last to know what to do first, right? So. We understand that the south coast of Trinidad was uplifted because of Cretaceous duplexing. So let me try to restore the Cretaceous rocks to a sort of semi-basinal level. Um, so I restored the Cretaceous down to a semi-basinal regional level. And then the back thrusting associated with the Los Barros Fault is known to be of Pleistocene age. So I restored these down towards the south. And then I restored the middle Miocene folds. So the whole aim was really just to try to get all of these throws out of the way. So we don't have anything um, being trusted over each other. Now that I have the throws out of the way, it's still folded up, of course. And we have to bear in mind that these are syn kinematic deposits. So they're gonna be thinning and thickening everywhere, right? But what I want to do now is then to unfold it. So I will hold one, one, one layer and, then and flatten it and <coughs> observe the topography below. So if I do this over the entire area, I can then build a, a, topograph a paleo -topograph 
topography map of what the surface below look like so that I can understand what, is, what's the, what sort of topography the sands were being deposited on. At the same time, I could do some calculations because I have different, uh, I have restorations along each of these seismic lines and I can compare the restoration along one seismic line with the other and come up with a vector model. So basically what it's just showing is that area A is an A and B have a, uh, there's a lot of deformation in those areas. A lot of folding took place in those areas. Whereas area Z is much less. But why is area Z much less? So this is something I, I, I kept in mind. Maybe it's related to the extensional faults, right? So maybe these extensional faults are actually tear faults and they separate the field and they take up a lot of the deformation along them. So, if I restored the, uh, the early, early Miocene level and observed the topography onto that, what I saw was these <coughs> anticlinal trends, right, and synclines, and more or less the synclines were all were mostly symmetrical. The areas that were um, pretty deep, though, I observed that there's a link between, there's a correlation between those areas and where um, you have subtle um, um, <coughs> parasitic trusting within the anticline. So it seems as if this, uh, these areas here collected all of these 7D, I uh, call it the 7D Herrera shields. <coughs> and in these areas, the, there's, these act as another detachment surface. <coughs> so moving forward in time now, if I flatten the 7 BC, which is a surface onto which this, the main reservoir um, sands were being deposited. I observe the anticline has gotten bigger. It correlates with where the sands are missing. The synclines are, have, have been shifted further to the south. There's a, there's a sort of low feature that's running along from the, north, from the northwest to the southeast, right? Is this feature related to the, those ex, those tear faults, I don't know for sure. <clears throat> and um, there's also areas where it seems as if you may have um, the uh, passage of sands from one from one syncline into the next. So is are these um, spill areas that that may that are these areas that may act as spill areas? So after the main um, reservoir was deposited. The synclines were much smaller at this time. The, the main deposition apparently shifted much further to the southwest, southeast, sorry. <coughs> and the, the anticlines themselves seem to be reshaping in such a way that they're, uh, they're, um, they're very steep towards the, the south, right? and the synclines on the hanging wall are <clears throat> much larger than the synclines to the south. Right. So I use the vector model then to try to restore each sand pick. So for instance, the same ACO1 well that I showed here that found the middle Miocene sands here and here and occur today basically in one spot, this spot here, I can restore each of these to, to various, um, to their respective spots at middle Miocene time. So by restoring this, I can then place the sand counts to each of these picks and sort of contour this. And so this would then give me, basically, sorry, this will then give me basically This will then give me basically an uh, idea as to the depositional pattern of the middle Miocene sands at this time. So using just the well data that I have, I came up with this map. So this is well data constrained middle Miocene GR7BC net sand map. And you generally see a north sand trend, a south sand trend, possible zones where sands are spilling from one into the other, right? 
and use, so this is all well and good, but what I want to know is in the areas where I don't have these sands, the, the, these well penetrations now, what, what are these sands going to be like? So I overlay now the sand map with the topographic map that I created, this map, and then try to see the relationships in between. Furthermore, in, in Midland Valley Move, you can do a sediment um, flow model where you can take this surface and put your, your um, well points, your, well, your sand values, your well control, and then flow a turbidite onto this. And you can experiment with it, put different flow regimes and stuff, size of the grains, the, the velocities, and uh, simulate now what, what sort of sand trend would you find on these areas. And so this is basically now the, the simulated depositional pattern of the Middle Miocene sands in this southwestern area. So I took some regional data that, um, that I found, um, bathymetric data um, from James Pindell, who did a, lo a lot of work in the Southeast and Caribbean. And basically this showed that, that more or less the northern sand trend plot along around the 400 meter water depth, whereas the no sands were definitely found beyond 550 meters water depth. And again, the areas um, that were that that um, were subtle highs during the deposition of the of the middle Miocene sands occurred along what is the penal barpool and decline, right here. <coughs> So, because I interpreted the area as different structures, as different truss slices, I could then overlay these, these structural zones to understand where these thick sands, possibly thick sands, would occur present day, right? So basically, um, I can identify these areas. This, this here becomes the intermediate limb, and it extends down this way, right? And these areas here occur in the overtrust. This is a subtrust. This is that main extensional fault, and there seems to be a lot of thickening of sands around that area as well. So what this gives us, it gives us a, a reassurance that in these areas, around this area here, we expect that there should be thick um, Herrera sands, and that um, the intermediate trend does continue towards the Los Bajos. So schematically now, um, the middle Miocene Herrera sands were being deposited onto these detachment folded structures. At the same time, we had those extensional faults breaking up the anticline, which may later then serve as tear faults in the area. And we deposited the 7A Herrera. We had shortcut falls forming. We, we then constrained the, the karma deposition towards the south. We started folding over these, these falls even more. And then we started capping this with the lengua formation. And then the lower crews. The upper cruise, which is the passive forward deep infill from the Orinoco. Forest formation, and at this time, it seems as if the amount of deposition in the area um, triggered those, some of those um, tear falls to reactivate and act as, um, as growth faults. And then, um, this is basically what the undecline looks like beneath the separatist incline. But as you go towards the east, the Cretaceous rocks have been ramped up and cause even more folding and more trussing within it. And that folds up the Pliocene formations as well. So in conclusion, present Pinal Barapo and Decline, it developed as an early Middle Miocene, early Miocene detachment fold, true term Miocene, Southeast Leaf Virgin tri share propagation fold. The Synchinematic middle Miocene turbidites were deposited in synclinal lows within the southern basin for deep. And restoration data suggests that the anticlinal structure 
west of the main extensional fault. Two, was formed prior to Pliocene source rock maturation, and so can be regarded as a separate structure from the main field to the east, and therefore is a good area to explore for, um, for uh, a new, probably a new oil field altogether. Um, forward modeling of these sands um, deposits occur in favorable structural traps with no signs of tertiary hydrocarbon migration post Pliocene impregnation. Um, tree seismic is definitely required to assess the complexity of the area. However, from the tree seismic that we've seen in the Northwestern District, it'll take a lot to image uh, at this depth. Um, and that's basically my talk. Thank you very much. Can I take a few questions? Yeah. Sure. Any questions? Linda. Were you able to use some of your modeling to estimate reserves in the fault blocks or any, uh, you know, uh, I know control does different basic modeling? Yeah, um, right. So re what we were able to do, we were able to estimate reserves within those truss slices, right? Um, however, we used um, general um, sand counts for, for the year. So a lot more work has to go into defining each, each of those sands and trying to estimate the volumes within each of those sands. So yeah, that, that's ongoing, yeah. Any other questions? So, so looking at the reconstructed section, is there upper Cretaceous source rock and deeper? I guess it'd be a subthrust wall. I don't exactly remember that section. Is there an upper Cretaceous source rock in this picture? Yes, yes. The, the upper Cretaceous is, is the main source rock for the area. And you're asking if there's a subthrust yeah. source rock to that. There is? No. Um, well, some areas in Trinidad have shown that that there, that there is a, um, that the Cretaceous ramp um, to Plessing is actually very very um, underestimated, and um, yeah, Cretaceous salt rocks are probably much deeper than the ones that that we're seeing as well. Yeah, and especially this area towards the east here. Yeah, some those Cretaceous the wells at Taos Mandrill here found some very interesting things down at Cretaceous level. Yeah. You said that these were shales, these Cretaceous shales with the source rocks? Yes. And were, all, were those the same shales that were acting as detachment surfaces? Um, I believe no. The um, the main detachment below the Cretaceous level would be the Jurassic evaporites. We call them the Kuva evaporites. There's also intraformational um, shales within um, a formation that's slightly older, called the Kush formation. That's believed to be source rock. Um, sorry, it's believed to be the main detachment surface for Cretaceous. In the northern basin, um, where I say that you have Pleistocene sitting on Pleistocene to Paleocene sitting on lower Cretaceous, you have Kush formation there alone. No Naprima Hill, no source rock. So the detachment surface exists there, but there is no source rock. So it lends uh, um, lots of theories as to why is there no source rock in the northern basin of Trinidad. Some, some theories were that that's a, a, a very big um, slide, so to say, that occurred, and you removed all of the Naprima Hill source rock that slid off the Kush formation, the detachment surface. That's one explanation. I was wondering, are there any successful wildcat wells outside of main field areas? I mean, when's the last time Trinidad had a new field discovered in this area? Oh, right. Yeah, actually, I can show on this diagram here. Um, so this is the main field here. And there's two wells that were drilled by Parex. Um, it's a small Canadian company that operates in Trinidad. Um, so they drilled this well, the Snowcap well. They went down to Herrera level, um, 600 barrels a day, condensate. Um, and, they, and they drilled another well, the Far Crown well as well. Um, they didn't release the production data on that one, but I was there, I knew it had oil, yeah. <laughs> it had oil <laughs> on that one. 